This is Leaders in the Trenches, and your host today is Gene Hammett. Hi, my name is Gene Hammett. I'm the host of Leaders in the Trenches, and my question today is, how important is the entrepreneur spirit inside your leadership? Meaning, how are you activating people to think and act like entrepreneurs? Well, I hope that you think this is really important. I hope you think that when you get people to feel like owners inside the company and you're activating that entrepreneur spirit, that they will take care of your business, that they will take care of your customers. They will grow the income and the profits of your business. And that's what I've seen happening. I've got a very special guest today. It is Frank Blake. If you don't know who Frank Blake is, let me give you a little bit of his resume. And, and I'm not trying to, to give you everything he's done, but this guy is impressive. Well, first of all, he was the former CEO of Home Depot. From 2007 to 2015, if I got, got those years right, he took over as CEO of Home Depot. And he, before that, he was uh, at GE with under Jack Welch and under his uh, mentorship as a leader. And then before that, he was uh, working in government. Before that, he was uh, an attorney. Now, long list of things that he's been through, but what we talked about today really strikes to the heart of your leadership about how you could activate others around you to feel like taking real ownership of the business. And what that really means is willingness to take risk and and really treat this. And and a lot of this was learned from Jack Welch. You'll see one of the important uh, paths to success under Jack Welch was willing to go against his decision and against his his, uh, ideas and then prove him wrong. That may sound odd, but he really appreciated the people that weren't the yes men or yes women. He appreciated people that were willing to disagree with him and prove him wrong and show him a better way. That's what got you promoted. So we talked with Frank Blake for a long time today. This is a very long uh, interview. Uh, It might be a little bit uh, spotty and some of the, the sound, but really, hopefully you'll take this in and really appreciate what I bring to you uh, with Frank Blake, former CEO of Home Depot. Frank, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Gene. Frank, I am a big fan. I, I first heard you on Andy Stanley's Leadership Podcast. I know you showed up in a few other places. Uh, yep. I'm going to let our audience hear straight from you because I've already told them a little bit about what you stand for. But tell us uh, about you and you know what you're doing right now. Uh, so, so I live in Atlanta. Uh, I, I was the CEO of Home Depot for eight years. Uh, Home Depot is, is headquartered here in Atlanta. I stepped down uh, as chairman in 2015, but I've stayed in Atlanta. Both of my kids live here. I've got uh, five grandkids, so uh, very, very rude. And they all live here in the Atlanta area, so very rooted in the Atlanta area. Uh, and since uh, retiring from Home Depot, I'm doing some public company boards. I'm the chair of uh, non-executive chair of Delta Airlines on the Macy's and Procter and Gamble board, and chair of this would be you would know it, Gene, being in the Atlanta area, but also chair of Grady Hospital, which is the awesome. local uh, safety net hospital for Atlanta. So, well, uh, keeping we, myself as busy as I want to be. Yeah, you, you are busy even in retirement. Um, when when I thought about having you on the show, I, and I tell this to a lot of times, so I'll go ahead and tell our, tell the audience, if you're listening in here, I named the show about people that are on the front lines, people that are leading their companies and are willing to, you know, get down there, get their hands dirty and lead from the front. And I heard you once say in an interview with Andy Stanley about, you know, how important it was for you to take some time to uh, put on an orange uh, apron and actually get in the store and actually serve customers. Why was that so important? There's a great saying in retail, it has to be adjusted somewhat now because of the internet, but there's a great saying in retail that all truth is found on the floor of the store. If you want to know what the customer is actually feeling, if you want to know how your associates are feeling, if you want to know what the shopping experience is, you have to go to the store. As I say, you now have to adjust that a little bit. You also have to know what's online. So you have to have a virtual experience, but it's very hard to connect with your business, particularly a retail business 
if you're not actually there in the store and make sure that you have a real experience there, not a, a, a trumped up experience, not one that's created for you. A lot of times leaders go to the factory floor or the retail floor or wherever it is and everybody knows in advance they're going and everything that doesn't move gets painted and it's all, you know, uh, a parade ground exercise. So you need to make sure that when you're there, you're actually seeing it as a as much as possible as a customer or as a frontline associate. See so that's in the trenches. And, and I remember you saying specifically, and I don't know if you've got a story or two around that, but you know, some lady would turn to you and say, can you help me get this to my car? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you would actually take, what? take out. <laughs> yeah, many times, many times uh, the best comment or maybe not the best comment but the one I remember the most was towards the end someone one of our customers saying to a cashier saying gee does Home Depot have a new program with AARP because there's an old ball guy out in the lot helping people with their carts yeah oh that's awesome yeah well let's go back you know maybe back into the beginning because I know you, you you came into uh, Home Depot through General Electric, and you had some time before that yep. in in the government area. So, and then before yep. that, you were an attorney. And I probably missed some yep. things in there. Is that is that about the big the big turning moments for you? Those are the big moments. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was. Uh, I have definitely not a background that anybody would have said this person's going to end up running uh, Home Depot. I started out life as a lawyer. Um, I worked in Washington, D.C., had a very typical kind of Washington, D.C. practice. Uh, started my own law firm with uh, 11, 12 other people and went in and out of government. I worked for George Bush's dad when he was vice president. I was general counsel of EPA. Uh, I eventually was the deputy secretary of the Department of Energy. In between, I, so I left uh, Washington. I found Washington very frustrating, and I left and and went to GE and worked in the GE power systems business as a lawyer. Long story, but ultimately transitioned on the build business side, ended up as a direct report to Jack Welch doing M&A for doing GE's uh, merger and acquisition work. Then came to Home Depot because the person who was running Home Depot at the time had also been at GE and I had worked with him while I was at GE. And then I became the CEO at the very start of 2007. Well, so, I appreciate those highlights because I guess yeah, I, uh, I want to dive into this time with Jack because Jack's known as, as a great leader. And I've heard you say this before, but um, there's so many facets to leadership. But when you were working with Jack, what did you learn about leadership? What's that one trait that was so important for leaders to, to embody? So I'll give a couple of answers and, and give sure. or, or a couple of traits. The first, the first trait is um, energy. So, and, I, and I'm a deep believer in this, that one of the things that leaders, business leaders, doesn't matter the size of your business. If you're the leader of the business, you need to be radiating energy. The organization feeds off of your energy in a way, which is why it's such a draining job. Jack was an enormously high energy person. I describe it as when I was working for him, if he called, and those were the days where you got many more phone calls than texts and things, but when he put in a phone call, I never took a call from Jack Welch sitting down. There was a reflexive, I am standing up because this requires all of my attention and focus because he is high energy on whatever that is at that time. So that was the first thing that impressed me with Jack. The second thing that was really important is uh, if you go back to that brief discussion we had on my background, I started as a lawyer at GE. The reason I moved, eventually was brought into the business side of it and, and what I think Jack was brilliant at is Jack was brilliant at making people think that, it, that you're path to success in the company was to disagree with it and be right. Now, if you're wrong, that was a different problem. But your path to success was to disagree with him and be right. Because as he would say, look, I don't need to pay a lot of people just to tell me, yes, I'm right. I want to, tell I want to be paying people who are going to 
tell me when I'm making a part of my career and the reason I was promoted and moved into the business side was there were instances where I disagreed with him. I organization that feeds off of real discussion and real communication in front of the boss. The final commentary that I'd make on kind of character traits of leadership and what I learned from Jack was more um, an after the fact, but it made sense. So when I became the CEO of the Home Depot, uh, early on, I put in a call to Jack. I said, look, would you spend a day with me and kind of give me CEO 101 and just tell me your lessons learned? And he was very gracious and we spent a day. And I then did that one day every year for the next eight years. I'd fly down, visit him, spend a day with him. I just can't tell you the amount of stuff I learned doing that. The last year, because it was the last year, I got I I had this really sophomore question that I asked that I wouldn't ask before because he kind of go ah, but I asked him, all right, if you were to boil it all down and say what's the single most important leadership characteristic there is, what's the single most important characteristic? And his answer both shocked me and then it made sense as I rewound my own career. And his answer was generosity. His answer was, and I expressed surprise because that wasn't obvious to me that that was what he was about. But his con comment was that as a leader, again, doesn't matter the size of the organization, what your organization is, but as a leader, you have to be fueled by the success of others. You have to be excited about the success that others are making in your organization. And if you are, that not only will fuel them, but fuel yourself. And when I looked at my time at GE through that prism, I realized that as tough as he was, and he was a really tough leader, as tough as he was, he was also really thrilled when you did something right. And when... You know, when the time came to give a out of boy or out of girl, he was that was part of his fuel. So long winded answer, but I learned an amazing amount from it. So when you were able to take that into your own time of CEO at Home Depot, how did it serve you through through the growth of, of the of the the big organization that you hadn't been used to? Yeah. Before? So the energy side of it, so the first part, the energy side um, and again, I don't think it matters what the size of the organization is. I talk about leaders are people who radiate out. They don't absorb in. And it's exhausting. And I know um, that if, if you really take it seriously, that your job as a leader is to be a force multiplier within your organization, it's tiring. And you got to be very conscious about how you recharge your batteries and how you don't take it all out on your family and all the rest of it. But it's tiring. It was absolutely the case with Home Depot. That was an exhausting. It was an exhausting job. <laughs> the, the second, uh, the second part about getting people to disagree and feel comfortable about disagreeing, I, I'd say I worked really hard on. I'm not sure I was ever as, I, in fact, I can be quite positive, I wasn't ever as good as Jack. Uh, and it's very difficult. I tell leaders that they are, you know, the saying, you know, boil a frog, you slowly boil a frog, right? You yeah. know that saying? Yeah. I tell leaders that they're the frog that their organization is boiling because you don't see it as a leader, but what happens is, that everybody starts to mold his or her opinion to yours. That they, they think the path to success is to tell you what you want to hear. Bernie Marcus, the founder of Home Depot, had a great comment to me early on uh, when I was CEO. He said, look, you're going to find that when you're sitting around the table with the people who work for you, you tell them how everybody's going to laugh. And he said, let me tell you, you're not that funny. But that's what the organization does. And it's, it's a constant effort to kind of break through that and get people to tell you what they really think. And again, I think that's 
any group that's more than five is subject to that exact <laughs> tell the boss what the boss wants to hear tell the boss what the boss wants to hear and then the final thing on the generosity uh so now i can say this is i put in the in the bucket of kind of geezer advice since i'm now uh old and can look back on my career i tell people now what is the case that the things you're going to be proudest of are the people whose careers you made. That's what you're going to sit around and talk about and be proud of. It's, uh, you know, I remember when so-and-so was, you know, a helpless, hopeless person and, you know, put some investment and directed and now look at where they are. And the, Sorry, I, I'm giving you these long-winded answers, but one of the single best moments to me, uh, actually being a Home Depot CEO came afterwards, just recently here, sitting in a restaurant here in Atlanta, and, and a store manager came up with his daughter, and he said, I want my daughter to meet you because it's because of you that she's going to college. And, you know, now that it's not because of me, obviously, there are a lot of other people, but that's what you want. That's, Absolutely. that's the biggest payback for any job. So, I, you know, you're probably not that familiar with, with my work and what I do, but one of the pieces, I, I wrote this book last year called The Trap of Success. I love it. I love um, the title. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, it, it comes from a place of, I was in business. I was, I had about a $5 million business and I wanted to do more, but I got very complacent. I got complacent with the money. I got complacent with the, the time I had available to myself right. and I wouldn't let myself grow. And I know a lot of people are like that. Now I'm in a different place where I'm looking for places to evolve and grow. How do you make sure that you never fell into a trap of success and, and continuously evolve, Frank? First off, I'm not sure I did. I mean, I, <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, I think, I think your book, I think that is a great title because, um, so uh, I, I, I phrase it slightly differently, but I suspect the concept is roughly the same, which is, you know, when you're growing, uh, when you break bones because the bones break and get stronger when they grow back. Yeah. And it's, but it's a scary thing to do, right? Things are going well now. Why do I want to break any? Why, why do I want to take risks? It's going great. <laughs> and personally, the reason you do is first, because if you were able to look around the corner, you go, because you need to do that. Because if you just keep doing the same thing and you fall into the trap of success, the success will eventually elude you as well. Because, you know, you, you need to be constantly reinventing. And secondly, because the, that's the path of growth. The path of growth is not falling into that trap of success and kind of being willing to reinvent things all the time. But I would not begin to say that I avoided that. I was conscious of it. And I like to think, we, for the most part, kind of got around it by constantly challenging ourselves, by not being afraid to break things. But, eh, you know. <laughs> you, you came into Home Depot during a, a, a little bit of a rough, rough patch there. It was 2007. Yeah. Uh, it was right around the corner. It was 2008, which was the, which was the housing right. market fallout. Yeah, However, 2007 was the housing crisis. <laughs> <laughs> how did you, how did you, um, you know, face that coming right into this huge organization, leading all right. these people uh, and having this big disruption facing you. So, uh, yes, 2007, eight and nine were three for the housing market, really horrible, horrible years. Uh, the first comment that I make to people is, uh, and you'll see this in all of the books, uh, which is you just got to be honest with the team. So, don't paint it for don't paint any rosier picture than what is actually in front of you the second comment is 
And this, I got great advice from the guy, there's a guy named Neville Isdell, who was running Coca-Cola at the time. And he, uh, and we were having lunch early on and he scrolling on a napkin. And I said, what are you scrolling? And he said, oh, I'm showing you a chart that's really important for you. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's, it's the chart and the, it just shows a line going down and then eventually recovering. And he says, this is the chart of the dark night of change. And everyone needs to understand that real change in an organization, even if the economy is going, real change in an organization, you don't go change, everything goes great. More often than not, you go change, things actually get worse for a while, and then they get better. And you have to make sure your team and you understand that dark night of change and that things will get better. So that's, in, I, again, my comment to leaders going, going through any sort of change is get used to the Henry V speech, if you know the Henry V speech. Um, Remind us of that, because maybe not everyone knows. So great, one of Shakespeare's great plays, Henry V is rallying the troops, uh, fighting at Agincourt, and a very small number of British beat some massive number of French. But to rally the troops in front of the battle, basically what he says is, you are all so lucky to be in this most disadvantaged stage because you will be able to claim the unique privilege of being here now before victory was certain. And that will, you know, double the significance of the victory when you achieve it. So I'm saying it very inelegantly, but I used yeah. to be able to do some yeah. version of the Henry VIII speech all the time. It reminds me, Frank, of a time when I was, I was going to do a half marathon here in Atlanta. This was oh. years ago. And Good I'd never you. done one before. And I misread the start time. So I would normally get there early, but I got there about, I guess about 30 minutes late. And I actually, when my, my girlfriend dropped me off a half a mile away from the start line, so I was walking up there and then I realized, oh, I'm, uh -oh. I'm late. Everyone's right. gone. Volunteers right. are gone. Everyone's gone. And um, when I, I went through that and I, I was running, I was actually so proud of myself because I saw my mom and dad, because this is the first time I've ever done one. And yeah. it was on Peachtree Street down uh, by Peachtree Battle. So I was going down the hill. And I said, see all these people? Every <laughs> one of them? I passed them all. <laughs> <laughs> I started from the way in the back. Uh, and, you know, That's as fun. leaders, sometimes we, you know, we got to remember, you know, the things that are going on inside us. So I want to ask you this question, like, how did you manage yourself going through this? Because I know a lot of leaders right now, they don't take time for themselves. They, they, they pour everything into the business. And how did you be able to, you know, really have the energy and, and have the, the thought to, to take care of yourself through all this? Uh, so my answer is not a great answer. Uh, okay. And, and I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, those around me would say I did it that well, other than to say that, um, so I didn't really have a recharge the battery or theory of resting and relaxation to recharge. Uh, for me, so I, I tell this story frequently, it's not a good story about myself, but it was a great learning moment for me. So early on, I tried to do a dinner every week or so with uh, hourly associates. So if I was traveling somewhere, we'd get 14 to 16 hourly associates together and we'd have dinner. If I was here in Atlanta, we'd get 14 to 16 hourly associates and we'd have dinner. Uh, the first or the second one I did, I'm sitting next to a woman, you know, roughly my age. She asked me, how's everything going? And I said, oh, it's great. But at the time, my back was hurting. And so I said, oh, you know, my back's hurting. And she said, oh, tell me about it. You know, complained about my back, blah, 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 blah. Now, mind you, I'm flying there on a company plane, staying at a really nice hotel, you know, 
eh, this is a pretty first world problem, even though on my back. Hurts. <laughs> I said, oh, how are you? And she said, well, you know, my back's hurting too. And I said, oh, uh, you know, what happened? She then describes, you know, she fractured her spine or done something horrible while she was working in the store and she had to be working from a wheelchair and handling things like lumber and other heavy objects when you're in a wheelchair is really difficult. So that was a really hard period for the last three months. You know, she's just out of the wheelchair. I'm, as she's going on, I'm going, oh my gosh. And I was feeling sorry for my little tweak of a back. And I said, oh, that's just horrible. And then she said, yeah, well, that's not the worst of it. And I said, oh, it is worse. What's, what's worse? And she said, well, you know, my, my 12 year old son is developmentally disabled and I have to bathe him every night. And now he's very large and I have to lift him in and out of the tub and that really, and she's going on about this. And I realized, um, I am so damn privileged. <laughs> that if I complain at all in the time that I have, uh, available to me to run the Home Depot, shame on me. So I just looked at it as comparatively uh, not much to ask. So that was, well, that was, I can that was appreciate my- that story. Um, when you were, were working and growing, um, I, I noticed, and, and when I was in the store the other day, I went to the restroom and, and, and one of the, um, on the wall was a circle that had the values of the company. Right. I don't know if you were involved with creating those. Were, were you involved with that? Um, no, no. So no, the, my benefit was that that the values on that value wheel, they were established by the founders of the company, uh, okay. Bernie Marcus and Arthur. Klein. And we talked a lot about them, but they were theirs. Well, that I, I can appreciate that. Cause I know that that sometimes happens. One of them stood out to me because I have seen this in my work because I, as I share with you, Frank, I work with hyper growth companies. So most of my clients and most of the, probably the people listening in here are either emerging into the Inc 5000 or or have already received honors to to be on that list. So they're the fastest growing companies out there. And one of the core uh, principles that, that really drives them is the entrepreneur spirit. Right. And Home Depot has one of the, the slices of this wheel as the entrepreneur spirit, how, yep. how was that played out and important for Home Depot's growth? Um, so uh, I, I believe every organization, uh, you need all of, you need as much mind share of everyone who works for you as possible. And you want them thinking like they own the business. And, uh, both Bernie and Arthur used to say to the store managers, imagine that it's your name above the store front, not the Home Depot. Uh, and that kind of, it's not just that I work here, but I own this business and I'm going to act like an owner. And, you know, we tried to encourage it through stock ownership and the way we talked about the business. but. Uh, that ownership and and that ownership comes with more commitment to the job but also an understanding in my mind the way i would always interpret entrepreneurial spirit is uh, a willingness to take some risks Uh, things will go wrong you'll make mistakes that's okay Uh, it's a great thing that i think structurally for Home Depot, that Home Depot was founded by two people who got fired from their prior job mm-hmm. running a home improvement mm-hmm. store. So they got fired yeah. from this home improvement store mm-hmm. and then they wow, built the best home improvement store in the history of the world. That's a good mindset to, you know, don't be scared, take some risks, be entrepreneurial. So, you know, didn't set this up, but the one of the things I speak about all the time, Frank, uh, because I, I'm paid to go around the country and actually right. internationally is to talk about how leadership can inspire people to feel like owners. Right. And yeah. I give them principles and, and really tactical takeaways. Like one of them is a radical transparency, the honesty that you talked about yeah. that got yeah. you through this. You know, another one is um, shared goals. Yeah. When you actually find the, what one person wants 
and how can you align that within their job to benefit the company and the person they yeah. show up differently. So um, when you, is there any stories that you can think of that, that kind of align with that entrepreneur spirit that you were, that Home Depot was really trying to um, inspire? Well, I, I mean, there are lots. Uh, and many of the great things that happen in the stores every day start because some entrepreneurial person in some store started the idea and then it grew like wildfire because it was successful. Uh, so there, there are lots of, of those examples of uh, just taking a risk and doing something and seeing, seeing it grow within, within the business. Um, I, retail in that way is, is a great business for the entrepreneurial spirit because you can see what all your competitors are doing. You can see what your other colleagues are doing and you can figure out your own spin on how you can make that better. Well, I, I wanted to share that with you because that, that's one of the core things that came out of fast growth companies. Um, now that you're, you're out of Home Depot, things are changing. What do you think is, is on the horizon or the evolution of leadership? Uh, I think, I think first that increasingly uh, people are looking at leaders to, I mean, my view of this was always true, but maybe it's clearer now than was always the case. Uh, but people are looking for leaders to invest in them. So I, I believe it's the case that people are understanding increasingly that they need to invest in their employees if their employees are going to invest in them. And they need to be thinking about making it clear. How do they make that clear to their employees that they are invested in their success and they care about their success? We've got a much, much more mobile workforce than we've ever had before. Uh, so it's not as easy to hold on to people. And, uh, I, th I think that's, a, as I say, I believe it's always true that the best leaders have always shown that they invest, you know, they've always told their employees what they're doing to help them, but I think it's even more so now, and empowering them to control their own lives. When, when you think about leadership, and, and there's two different schools of thought, put the customer first or put the employee first, where do you come down on that, that spectrum? Uh, I think it's I think it's kind of a false choice. I think they're they're the same. Um, so so the way I would put it is the customer at some point is is foundational. No business succeeds unless it has a better answer for a customer problem than anybody else. So in that sense, the customer is at the root of it all. Because in the end, you're running off of the customer's money. So you don't have customer money. Everything else can be going great, but it doesn't matter. In that sense, the customer is first. But on the other hand, if you're not uh, treating your employees well, if you're not taking care of your employees, why would you think in the long run or even the medium and short run, you're employees will take care of your customers the way you want. And so there are some rare companies where their product is just so amazing that it doesn't matter whether their employees are engaged or indifferent or whatever. But for most companies, if you want to provide that amazing customer experience, you've got to have engaged employees or associates who really buy into what the company is doing. So in that sense, I think it's a false choice. But if you had to, if you had to make the choice in the end, everybody, you, nothing happens without the customer. So the way I describe it, Frank, and, and I could be wrong in this, but you've got to have be customer centric. Yeah. But you've got to put the employees first and so that the employees can know that you're taking care of them and that they can put the customers first in their world. 
Yeah. Um, and it becomes that, that kind of cyclical circle and leadership is, is the, is the driving force that, that really shapes all that. Um, I agree with it. One of my top articles for Inc. Magazine is managers are a dying breed. What we need instead are leaders. Yep. Um, when you think about managers in your world, and, and, and I'm not going to talk about Home Depot or specifically, because I know you're still working with a lot of companies. Um, what do you think is going on with, with the whole management versus leadership now in business? Yeah, I, I think uh, management, it's all definitional, right? Yeah. But to the extent you just take the word and you say management is a function of controlling variables and you know just kind of taking different outputs and inputs and managing those. Uh, it probably never was that successful. It probably always required leadership, but it's much, much clearer now in a fast-paced uh, environment that's changing rapidly that if you're just managing inputs and outputs um, and not leading an organization through change, you have very little chance of surviving the change. I think, my guess is that that was actually true in the 60s, <laughs> just people didn't think about it that way, and they didn't understand, you know, the people working at, you know, not to pick on the auto industry for a second, but the people working at GM or Ford or whoever, didn't really understand the pace of change that was coming at them from Japan. Yeah. It would be hard pressed to find business leaders now everywhere who don't understand the pace of change coming from China, coming from online, coming from all of the different vectors of competition. So you know that if you're just trying to manage outcomes, you stand no chance. You've got to be leading through change because everything is changing so rapidly. I, I totally understand how, how that's such an important driver right now. When, when you are working with, with companies and you're probably, are you still involved with M&A at all or? No. Okay. My first job ever was doing a lot of M&A work. Um, I was uh, right out of Georgia Tech. Okay. And, and I remember my boss said, this, this company says its valuation is 150 million. Can you tell us if that's true or not? And I looked at the prospectus and I'm like, it looks like a pretty solid company. And she's like, yeah, but you need to find the, the shadows and, the, and the, the, the snakes inside this company. Yeah. And so I went out there and interviewed a bunch of companies to figure out, was it really worth the $150 million? Uh, The reality was it wasn't. <laughs> right. 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 Um, but I wanted to ask you about, you know, looking at things today and maybe give you a, a chance to uh, rant a little bit and I don't want you to take that in a bad way, but what really irritates you about uh, business today? Is there anything specific factor that, that really kind of gets under your skin? Uh, not really. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I don't have rants. Uh, you know, there's some people who rant about, you know, hey, you got to meet quarterly numbers and no long-term thinking. I actually don't rant about that. I actually think if I'm in a public company, and I'm asking shareholders for their money to invest in my company. Hey, if I were a reasonable person, I'd be telling them how I'm doing every few months. Uh, I'd be setting out milestones to give them confidence in the short term that I can do what I say I'm going to do in the long term. So I don't rant about that. I think companies, uh, particularly now, have a have a good anchoring in in what they're doing in their communities. You don't see many companies that are disassociated from what's happening in their communities that don't take a stewardship view of what their role is with the community. Um, I think, you know, business has changed an awful lot uh, in the last, you know, five decades that I've been around. So, no, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have any particular rants. Well, I wanted to give you, give you a chance if you have Thanks. anything. W one thing we haven't talked about here, and, and I heard this from another interview you did with Tim Ferriss around, you know, it's one thing to measure the numbers, 
It's another right. thing to, to really celebrate what we want to reinforce. Um, Tell us a little bit more about why celebration within leadership is such an important piece of growth. I, it's my number one learning from my time at Home Depot. Number one learning. I didn't understand it before I started, and I view this as if, if I learned anything at all, it was, you know, so you have the business saying that you get what you measure. I think as important or the corollary is you get what you celebrate and recognize and that companies aren't nearly intentional about what they celebrate uh, what you ought to do as a leader of any any kind of leader with any group you got to say here's where i want to move whatever your direction is here's the behavior that i want and when you see people moving in that direction and that behavior recognize and celebrate it because otherwise everything you do or otherwise you risk having what you say in other contexts just be abstractions and the great thing about recognition and celebration is we get it we understand as human beings if you go gosh look at this amazing thing gene did and i hold gene up in front of my group around the table i say gene Thank you for doing A, B, and C. And I give Gene whatever it is, the company lucky penny. It doesn't matter what it is. But Gene, here's the company lucky penny. Everybody else around the table goes, oh, all right. Is that what the boss wants? Really? Okay, well, I can get the lucky penny. I don't know why, I don't know why Gene got the lucky penny. I do stuff like that all the time. And so it reinforces the behavioral patterns that you want within an organization and my comment is you you want to know what an organization does show me what an organization celebrates show me what they celebrate and i'll tell you what's important to that organization do they celebrate cost cutting do they celebrate innovation do they celebrate taking a risk do they celebrate making the numbers you tell me what the boss actually is celebrating versus what he or she may think they celebrate, but show me what they actually are giving recognition and, and you know plaudits for, and I'll tell you what drives that organization. So, it's, I'm, it's, we are not that complicated. Human beings are not that complicated. Tell us. You know, jump here and everybody's going to clap and applaud. We'll jump. Now let's jump here and everybody's going, oh, okay, that was fascinating. You know, we won't care so much about jumping. It's just the way we are. Well, I, I will tell you, when I was doing some research with the hypergrowth companies that I talked about before, we talked about innovation a lot. And, you know, a couple of the companies said, you know, we love to celebrate failure. And I said, well, how do you celebrate failure? And they said, well, at the end of the year, we have these award banquets where we celebrate success, but we, we pick one team to recognize is a failure that led to a breakthrough. Right. And right. it could be a small failure. It could be a really big failure. We're not asking them to take, you know, uncalculated risk, but what did it lead to the breakthrough? And yep. um, th does that surprise you? No, that's exactly right. And again, I go back to Bernie Marcus, uh, the founders of Home Depot, and that was one of the things he said to me said, make sure you celebrate failures because to your comment on entrepreneurial spirit, you can't have entrepreneurial spirit without failure. So if you don't, if, if you don't take the time to do just what you said, Gene, pull somebody up and say, this was great. This was a noble failure. Everybody else is going to internalize. Oh, okay. Well, you know, they might say entrepreneurial spirit, but what they're really saying is entrepreneurial spirit that works. Well, entrepreneurial spirit that works is not entrepreneurial spirit, right? I mean, you don't, it's entrepreneurial because you don't know at the start are you going to succeed or fail. Yeah. So if yeah. you can get fired if you fail and they, everybody, I mean, that's why I say the disconnects that organizations have around what they think they're encouraging and what they actually encourage are profound because you can have somebody say all the words 
about entrepreneurial risk taking and all the rest of that. But if what they recognize and celebrate are all down the road, middle of the road successes, are they going to be surprised that they never see anybody take a risk? They shouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're talking about this, Frank, you know, I I always have a a practical and actionable segment inside my interviews. And so I want to ask you, you talked about one thing you did with, with Jack, you know, one day out of the year, you would go down there and and take some time away from the business to, to work on yourself and the way you're thinking about everything. Um, What would you suggest that, that, that leaders of businesses today do, you know, as a practical and actionable step to, to growth in an organization? Uh, wow, there's so many. But um, so the one practical step is, uh, and this kind of depends on the size of an organization, but I'm a real believer in travel time. So uh, take someone, whoever it is, uh, from your organization and travel for a day. No, there's, there's no place to go. No place to run, no place to hide, no escape. You're in the car, you're in the plane, wherever it is you're going. And it gives you a real, I mean, you know, meetings are okay, but meetings tend to involve lots of people. They get very political. People are very guarded about what they say and they don't say, get away with someone, go somewhere. And, you know, have that lunch in a strange place. Have the conversation as you're driving along. Know what it is you want to ask about. and I mean, be intentional about it, so just don't randomly go off and travel. But yeah. those were yeah. almost always my best meetings. I learned the most. And it wouldn't be necessarily in the first half hour or hour because everybody kind of guarded in the first half hour or hour. But by the day, guards down. They're talking to you about what they really care about, what they think is going well, what they don't think is going well. What I mean, so I'm a big fan on a practical level of spend a day with someone. Just spend a whole day. I, I love that because it's, it's easy enough for us to do and to, to make sure we don't squander that opportunity because some people right. won't, won't actually have the conversations. Maybe they'll spend most of the time on their phone instead of yeah. actually connecting with someone. Yeah. Well, Frank, we're going to wrap this up. I really appreciate you being here at Leaders. No, thank you. Uh, you know, I don't know if you if if you want people to follow you. I know you've got a podcast. Like, what, what's yeah. the name of your podcast again? So, so thank you for the podcast has nothing to do with business. The podcast is called Crazy Good Turns, and we celebrate people who do remarkably kind things for other people. And the principle is the same that we've just been talking about. It's uh, to me, those folks are worth celebrating and recognizing because they do, you know, just remarkably kind things for others. So, thank Fantastic. You. Well, uh, crazy good turns. Frank, thanks for being here and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Gene. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. All right. Fantastic interview with Frank. I just so love what I do. I know I say this all the time, but... He is someone I looked up to. He's been on a, you know, a handful of other podcasts. It's a really big get for my show to be able to share his thoughts about leadership and about what's moving forward. Hopefully, you're building a culture of growth. And if you haven't taken the growth culture scorecard, make sure you do that. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash culture, and you'll be able to see where you stand and, and have a real conversation around where are the gaps in your organization and how do you move forward create a growth culture. Well, that's my piece today. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. Enjoy the next one that we're going to be coming together because we've got a, a huge lineup of guests coming. And as always, lead with courage and I'll see you next time.